William the Conqueror, one of history's most significant rulers, and yet one of England's most controversial kings. As a child, he became the Duke of Normandy, a position he inherited from his father. As a young man, he set out on one of the most daring projects of the Middle Ages, the invasion of England. At Hastings, the charge of William's Norman knights was pitted against Harold Godwinson's axe-wielding infantry. By bloody conquest, William imposed Norman rule on an Anglo-Saxon kingdom. And through an even bloodier occupation, William maintained that rule. Down to this very day, the controversy persists. Some believe that William, by establishing closer ties between France and England, helped to put England at the forefront of medieval civilization and thus increased the country's long-term power, wealth, and innovation. Others view William as a hostile invader who despoiled English law, imposed an unjust foreign tyranny, and inflicted decades of horrific suffering on the English people. Regardless of the debate, there's no denying the significance of William's life and career, which would leave an impact that can still be felt to this day. William's father was Duke Robert the Magnificent. By the 1030s, when William was a small child, he was already being treated as his father's potential heir. In 1035, William, probably only seven or eight years old, took part in a ceremony in which he acknowledged his father's grant to an important Norman noble. During this ceremony, William received a blow. This was meant to be a physical manifestation of the pact to which all could refer in the future should any disputes arise. The Normans believed that a small boy would remember the agreement better by the blow he'd endured. It's surprising to moderns to imagine a child being subjected to such a ritual. And yet, for the Normans, this was vital to the initiation of their sons into the world of knightly politics, in which the mutual obligations between vassal and lord were at the heart of society. As son of the Duke, William received a princely education. With his tutor, he learned basic Latin. He also was educated in the ethics and traditions of the Norman elite. And of course, William was trained to be a knight, perfecting the art of cavalry warfare at which his people excelled. He learned to fight in a group of mounted Normans. He was taught to steer hot-blooded warhorses while wielding his shield and lance. A good portion of William's education came from his own father, Duke Robert, who personally imparted his skills to his son. Like all medieval princes, William was brought up with a group of aristocratic boys who had become the central core of his knights. Among these were his cousin, Guy of Burgundy, and William Fitzosborne, both of whom were like brothers to William. In 1035, Duke Robert decided to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. This alarmed the Norman nobility, who feared the Duke might die during this voyage, opening the door to instability at home. Robert made meticulous preparations for his departure. He held an assembly of all the Norman magnates, presenting them with his son. The Duke named William as his heir and asked the nobles to accept him as Lord. Despite William's tender age, the Normans gladly gave him their fealty, a testament to their confidence in Robert. In Norman society, a ruler could designate his heir, but he must also gain the agreement of the great men of the realm. Unfortunately, the worst fears of the nobles came to pass. In July of 1035, Duke Robert died while returning from Jerusalem. This was a great blow to William, who revered his father. Although the nobles confirmed William's succession as Duke of Normandy, the reign of a minor was inherently tumultuous, and many anticipated troubled times. In introducing this phase of William's life, the chronicler William of Malmesbury quotes a passage from the Bible 
Woe to the land whose king is a child. William's relative, Count Gilbert of Brion, was named chief guardian of the eight-year-old duke. William's protectors tried to maintain stability, but by the 1040s, many nobles were settling their rivalries through bloody private warfare, and the young duke's representatives had little power to stop them. The violence was spilling into the ducal court. Some factions saw the minority as a prime opportunity to either seize control of the child ruler or eliminate him, whichever might better serve their ends. Gilbert of Brion was killed within months of attaining his post. In the early 1040s, an assassin managed to enter the child duke's quarters and slay Osborne the steward, one of William's primary guardians. Some accounts claim that Osborne was stabbed to death in William's own bedchamber as he lay sleeping. One can only imagine what sort of an impact such experiences would have had on a small boy. William would have learned quickly that he'd been born into a world of ruthlessness and that survival required him to discover his own ruthlessness. Above all, he vowed that one day he would, like his father, impose order through strong rule. Crucial to young William's survival was the continued presence at court of his mother, Herleva, and her male relatives. An intelligent and determined woman, Herleva was fiercely protective of her son. Some accounts claim that her brother, Walter, slept beside his young nephew to ensure his safety and occasionally had to flee with the boy in the dead of night to protect his life. Later, William would praise the actions of his mother's family during these difficult years. While the violence that plagued the court of the Duke of Normandy during William's minority is striking, historian David Bates cautions us from viewing the period as pure chaos. The upper Norman nobility struggled with one another for control of the duchy's future, but their feuding was governed by a strict code which limited the brutality. Bates calls this culturally structured violence. As an example, Bates points to the slaying of Osborne the Steward, which was committed by the son of a nobleman called Roger of Montgomery. William's guardians at the court expelled Roger of Montgomery from lands that had been granted to him by the late Duke Robert. Roger's son killed Osborne in retaliation for this affront. One of Osborne's followers avenged his master's death by killing the murderer. This brought an end to the feud, and in the future, both factions collaborated. Roger of Montgomery's son, Roger II, cooperated closely with Osborne's son, William Fitz Osborne, during William the Conqueror's reign. Having glimpsed the childhood of William the Conqueror, perhaps we can better understand the harshness of his later rule. The turmoil that he experienced as a boy, rather than breaking him, hardened him, and made him determined to be his own master. He meant to impose an order that would render impossible the upheaval that he'd known as a child. To many, William's plan to conquer England must have seemed like some mad, desperate quest. He planned to invade one of the wealthiest and strongest kingdoms in Northern Europe. Some of his advisors took a realist position and urged him to abandon the project, but history is rarely decided by realists. On one side of the English Channel lay the Duchy of Normandy. Its ruler was Duke Robert I, a descendant of Vikings, known to some as Robert the Devil, and to others, Robert the Magnificent. At his court, Duke Robert fostered a young exile, Edward, son of a deposed English king. The boy Edward would himself eventually become Edward the Confessor, King of England. In 1035, Duke Robert died while returning from a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. His illegitimate son, William, took the throne. Viking blood and a turbulent youth gave William a hard, practical personality. But he was also a man of considerable vision, able to foresee opportunity where others saw only danger. William's early years were spent overcoming rebellious vassals and resisting attacks by his own overlord, the King of France. By 1060, William had secured Normandy from internal and external dangers. His thoughts increasingly turned to an invasion of England, so seductively close, just beyond the narrow English Channel. 
William already had some ties to England. His father's one-time ward, Edward the Confessor, had become King of England in 1042. Edward has often been described as a withdrawn and unwarlike man. The kingdom's true power lay with Edward's brother-in-law, Harold Godwinson, one of Anglo-Saxon England's leading nobles, who acted almost as a second king. When Edward the Confessor died childless on January 5, 1066, the Anglo-Saxon nobles selected Harold to take the throne. Harold, who had been at Edward's side as he took his final breaths, insisted that the late king had said that he wished him to succeed to the throne. Harold Godwinson quickly proved to be an energetic and formidable ruler. In September of 1066, he defeated an invasion led by Harold Herdrada of Norway, a fierce adventurer king of the old Viking variety. Meanwhile, in Normandy, Duke William's own army was too small to invade England alone, and so he worked tirelessly to recruit allies. Brittany, Flanders, and even the new Norman states of southern Italy would all contribute troops to William's coalition. But William also sought spiritual legitimacy for his campaign. A Norman embassy visited Pope Alexander II in Rome, arguing that Harold Godwinson was an usurper, and that in fact, Edward the Confessor had promised the throne to William during a meeting between the two in 1051. The claim was not entirely outlandish, as Edward and William were distant cousins, and Edward had taken refuge at the court of William's father. Pope Alexander decided to endorse the invasion. William had already proved himself a reliable supporter of the papacy's reform effort, and this made him an attractive ally. The Pope sent William a papal banner to carry into battle. She was The Bayou Tapestry illustrates the intense preparation for William's campaign. The gathering of men and horses, the felling of trees for the building of ships, the loading of provisions. At last, on September 27, William's ships were launched across the channel. The Norman army landed at Pevensey and soon established a base at Hastings. The Battle of Hastings was fought on October 14. Harold organized his troops in front of a forest at the top of a steep slope, the enemy would be forced to attack uphill. The Anglo-Saxon warriors, housegarls, fought as an infantry force, standing in a tight shield wall formation, ready to smash at any attacker with their enormous axes. William hoped to overwhelm the Anglo-Saxon infantry with Norman cavalry. On their fearsome war horses, Norman knights were formidable indeed able to deliver a devastating charge, famous for shattering infantry formations. After his archers unleashed arrows at the sturdy housecarls, the Norman knights moved in. At first, the housecarls did indeed hold the advantage, beating back Norman charges as quickly as they were deployed. The fighting was fierce and bloody. Confusion began to spread through the Norman ranks, and at one point, rumors spread that Duke William himself had been slain. This caused one Norman contingent to fall back in a panic, but William himself rode out to rally them, famously lifting up his helmet to show his face, crying out, I live, I live, and God willing will conquer still. Seeing their enemies break, some of the English rushed to give pursuit. When the Normans rallied, they defeated these English divisions. Later, William organized a number of feigned retreat maneuvers, which drew more English troops into pursuit, allowing the Normans to swing around and crush their pursuers. Late in the day, King Harold himself fell in battle, traditionally from an arrow wound to the eye. This proved to be the decisive moment. Many of the English troops broke and fled, though the royal bodyguard stood firm, fighting to the death. The Norman cavalry mowed down the fleeing troops. The battle was over. The Normans were victorious. Duke William was now William the Conqueror. The field was littered with corpses, but William searched for the body of Harold, so battered and bloody as to be virtually unrecognizable. William apparently had the body of the last Anglo-Saxon king buried by the sea, since Harold had so strongly stood in defense of the coast. 
William's victory at Hastings was only the beginning of the Norman capture of England. Some of the Anglo-Saxon nobility tried to resist his conquest, but William harried the countryside, brutally suppressing any resistance. Ultimately, William was crowned king on Christmas at Westminster Abbey, and so began the age of Norman England. William the Conqueror is widely known to have been the illegitimate son of Robert I, Duke of Normandy. In light of the earth-shattering Norman conquest of England in 1066, much has been made of the circumstances of William's birth. Was this Norman upstart, who took England by force, even the rightful Duke of Normandy? Over the centuries, William's detractors have delighted in pointing out that he was supposedly born on the wrong side of the sheets. But how accurate is this idea? Today, on Real Crusades History, we will explore this question. William was born in either 1027 or 1028. His father was the Duke of Normandy, Robert the Magnificent. His mother was Herleva, a Norman maiden of obscure origins. Herleva most likely sprang from the ministerial class, the urban bourgeoisie from which the Norman dukes traditionally recruited their lesser court servants. Tradition holds that Robert was deeply attached to Herleva and that the two enjoyed a close relationship. One fanciful story describes Herleva, after lying with the Duke, dreaming of a tree that sprang from her body and covered the whole of Normandy. However, Robert and Herleva were never married according to the rules of the Christian Church. Today people wonder at this illegitimate son becoming not only Duke of Normandy, but King of England. But how did the Normans of the mid-11th century, William's contemporaries, view the relationship between his parents? How was William himself viewed by his own society? Did the Normans consider William's birth to be socially disadvantaged? The 11th century was an age of great change. The centuries-long integration of Roman, pagan, and Christian heritage into the civilization of Christendom was reaching its apogee. The Normans themselves were latecomers to this process, having recently been pagan Vikings. Increasingly, they were conforming themselves to church law and yet many old traditions persisted. The Historia Normanorum, written in the late 10th, early 11th century by Dudo of St. Quentin, contains a highly revealing eulogy on Christian marriage. The language shows that the Normans were determined to portray themselves as models of Christian legitimacy. For the Normans, Christian marriage was now clearly the ideal, and yet the keeping of concubines endured. William's great-grandfather famously married Gunnor after having kept her as a concubine. The Burgundian monk and chronicler, Ralph Glaber, reveals much about William's early status. He tells us that while Duke Robert had no son born of a Christian marriage, it was a long-standing custom of the Normans to take their rulers from among the sons of their chieftain's concubines. Ralph, as a churchman, expresses his personal distress at this idea, but he also points out that, according to the standards of the Norman warrior elite, William should be considered Duke Robert's legitimate son who could legally succeed his father. So while the Normans, in theory, had adopted the church's view of marriage, in practical terms, they still at times operated via older methods. William's very name is indicative of his status. The naming of noble children was not a random affair in the medieval era. A high-ranking family drew upon a collection of names to indicate status, and William's name was certainly among the ducal stock. Historian David Bates says that any notion of William having a socially disadvantaged childhood because of the circumstances of his birth is a total myth. It was only later, long after William's death, that his so-called illegitimacy became magnified. Had Duke Robert in fact contracted a Christian marriage with some high-born noble lady, Surely any sons born to that union would have taken precedence over William. Indeed, Robert may very well have ultimately entered into such a marriage had he not died so early in his reign while making a pilgrimage. Another possibility is that Robert might have married Herleva herself, just as his ancestor Duke Richard had married his concubine Gunnar. 
However, the fact that Robert the Magnificent ultimately died unwed produced no crisis of legitimacy, as it would have only a few decades later. David Bates also says that to normalize William's parentage and beginnings in this way is not to say that they did not affect his personality and his behavior, or how he was viewed by others. It is actually very clear that they did have a considerable effect, but not necessarily in ways that disadvantaged him politically and socially. Thus, we have to be careful when discussing the circumstances of William's birth to take into account the complex tensions influencing the norms of his era. We shouldn't assume that modern concepts of legitimacy held the same meaning for the 11th century Norman elite. At the close of summer in 1087, William the Conqueror, the Norman Duke who had wrested England from the Anglo-Saxons, lay dying at the Priory of St. Gervas near Rouen. Only weeks earlier, William had been in the saddle, commanding his men in an attack on Mont. While the town was being burnt, William had fallen ill. He'd remained active to the end, but by now, the one-time tireless warrior king was old and obese, his energy waning. The illness was serious enough that he withdrew to a sickbed at St. Gervas. As William's condition worsened, anxiety increased among his vassals. William had inherited the Duchy of Normandy from his father, but it was by a spectacular conquest that he'd seized the Kingdom of England. William destroyed England's old Anglo-Saxon power structure with ruthless violence. Northern England he'd subdued through a campaign of shocking brutality that produced masses of wandering, starving orphans. Out of this carnage, William had created a cross-channel empire, joining Normandy with England. But this new political structure was largely held together by the force of William's personality. Now, as the Norman nobles stood around the king's deathbed, they wondered what was coming next. Rebellion? Chaos? Upheaval on both sides of the channel? The violence of William's conquest of England had scandalized all of Christendom. Many wondered if God would ultimately punish the endeavor. The 11th century was a time of deep religious belief in which no one doubted the consequences of God's anger. William himself was certainly conscious of his sins. As he lay dying, he released many of his prisoners, including Wolfnoth, brother to Harold Godwinson, the Anglo-Saxon king slain during William's conquest. William also made lavish donations to the church and appropriated vast sums for the relief of the poor. The Norman chronicler, Ordric Vitalis, tells us that the king, as he made his deathbed confession, expressed great sorrow and regret over the bloodshed involved in England's conquest. Throughout his long final illness, William remained lucid, explaining his last wishes to those gathered around him. To his eldest son, Robert Curthose, William left the Duchy of Normandy. To his second eldest son, William Rufus, the king bequeathed England. Then, on the morning of September 9th, William awoke and announced that he was commending his soul to the Virgin Mary. Then he died. The hours that followed were chaotic. The Norman nobles, who'd so dutifully attended their lord's deathbed, abandoned the king's body. Some, expecting upheaval, rushed off to fortify their castles. Some even expelled the garrisons installed by William himself, installing their own men in their place. In the streets of Rouen, people wandered about as if in a daze, anguished over thoughts of what could be coming. William had been a hard ruler, but he'd brought stability and predictability. Meanwhile, at the Priory of St. Gervas, servants plundered the room where William had died. The body was left lying exposed on the floor. The clergymen and monks of the city, recovering from their initial shock, finally organized a funeral procession. But with all the nobles and servants having fled, there was no one to prepare the body. At last, a simple country knight, by the name of Erluin, took it upon himself to make the arrangements. He found William's corpse lying naked in the barren room at St. Gervas, everything having been stolen, including the king's clothes. Finally, the Archbishop of Rouen had the king's body transported to the Seine, where it was taken by boat to Caen for burial. The events of William's funeral at Caen are equally strange. As the body was carried to the church of Saint-Étienne, a fire broke out in the town, disrupting the procession. 
Following Mass, Bishop Gilbert of Evro delivered an eloquent sermon to a congregation made up of clergy and only a small number of laymen. Neither Robert Curthos nor William Rufus was in attendance. Only William's youngest son, Henry, was present. Before the body could be buried, a man called Asselon stepped forward. This ground is mine, he proclaimed. The king took it from me when this church was built and gave me no compensation. The clergy, judging the case right then and there, determined that Asselon was correct and compensated him. When the attendants finally began lowering the body into the grave, they found that the king's corpse was too swollen to fit into its final resting place. An attempt was made to force the body in, which caused it to rupture, releasing a putrid smell that prompted everyone to shrink back. In life, William I of England had not been a beloved king, but rather a feared one. The chaos that accompanied his death reveals something about the contradictory situation created by his career. On the one hand, he was a gifted politician who instilled order through his personal drive and determination. On the other hand, the project of the English conquest had been traumatic and devastating, and the newly established cross-channel empire seemed rife with uncertainty. As it turned out, William laid the foundations for the Angevin Empire, which would endure until the 13th century. Norman political sensibilities played no small part in this. Perhaps the most striking aspect of William's final will is the cleaving of Normandy from England. In life, the king had labored tirelessly to unite the two. Robert Curthos might have inherited both England and Normandy, but the relationship between father and son had been horribly strained by Robert's multiple rebellions. To understand William's final decision, historian David Bates reminds us that, among the Normans, succession was determined by the will of the dying ruler, but also by the consensus of the great men who followed him. Robert Curthos could not simply be disinherited, as this would prompt a reaction from the Norman nobility. Bates believes that William was not only unhappy with his eldest son's rebelliousness, but he had come to believe that Robert Curthos did not have the hardness necessary to be an effective ruler. Thus, William the Conqueror foresaw a situation of almost certain war among his sons. Dividing the realm was damage control. William at least left his sons with an obligation to collaborate. Other historians have not been so generous as Bates. Frank Barlow describes William's decision as the dismemberment of a great achievement done in anger, bitterness, and sorrow, pointing to William's stubbornness toward Robert Curthos. Although he'd not attended the funeral, William Rufus commissioned a tomb of gold, silver, and precious stones to be placed over his father's grave. But this has not survived. Today, only a plain stone slab marks the burial site of King William the Conqueror. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle provides a haunting epitaph. He who was earlier a powerful king and lord of many a land, he had nothing of any land but a seven-foot measure. And he who was at times clothed with gold and with jewels, he lay then covered over with earth. Check out the Real Crusades History store for Crusades and Templar-themed t-shirts and other items. Click the link below.